Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob here, Light of the World Ministries in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Turn your King James Bible to the book of Exodus. We're going to take a look at chapter 23. I'm going to try to go through everywhere where angels are mentioned in the Bible. They are messengers. They have different purposes. Even Satan has his purpose in God's plan, if you can believe that. But believe it, it's true. All right, Exodus 23. Thou shalt not raise a false report. Put not thine hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. Uh, people, back in the these days, if it would take two or three witnesses to convict somebody of a crime, and if three witnesses saw somebody, you know, said they saw somebody murder somebody, um, punishment for murder was death. So three people could put somebody to death. Now, the thing was, is if you got caught um, being a false witness, perjury, you know what the penalty was? Whatever it was that you tried to get that um, your testimony against the person. So if you, well, I'm, I'm probably not explaining that well. If you testified against somebody that they did murder and the penalty for what you were testifying against them was for was death, and you were found guilty of uh, perjury, you got the same penalty, death. So people thought very carefully about perjury back in them days. You know, uh, when women divorce men, uh, perjury, they can lie all they want. And maybe one woman out of a thousand has any kind of repercussions at all. I mean, I've seen it. I mean, they can lie in, in a court, and then the man proves that they're lying, and judges don't do anything. But I tell you what, in God's court, perjury was a big major no-no. So, verse 2. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Riots. Neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to wrest judgment. Neither shalt thou countenance a poor man in his cause. In his cause. If thou meet thine enemy's ox or his ass going astray, thou shalt surely bring it back to him again. That's a good way to turn an enemy into a friend. Doesn't always work. Keep thee far from a false matter. And the innocent and righteous slay thou not, for I will not justify the wicked. And thou shalt take no gift. Now we're talking about bribery here. Thou shalt take no gift, for the gift blindeth the wise and perverteth the words of the righteous. Also thou shalt not oppress a stranger, for ye know the heart of of a stranger, seeing ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. And six years thou shalt sow thy land and gather, and shalt gather in the fruits thereof. But the seventh year thou shalt let it rest and lie still, that the poor of thy people may eat, and that they leave the beasts of the field, and what they leave the beasts of the field shall eat. In like manner, thou shalt le uh, deal with thy vineyard and with thy olive yard. Now, the test of faith was that in the sixth year, you'd have a an abundant harvest. You know, just, and then the seventh year, 
you let the land sit fallow. And that would help rejuvenate the land. For example, you could take um, a nitrogen-fixing plant like beans or a plants like alfalfa that has a very, very deep tap root that brings minerals up from way below, uh, sometimes 30 feet or 10 meters down. And then you just don't harvest it. You let it, uh, I forget what they call it, a green, green manure. I, I guess that's what they call it. You just plow it under the next year and then it, it replenishes the uh, soil. And I know people that do this and they tell me it works. And I believe them. One of them is a pastor of a church in Missouri. He's in Shell City. Church of Israel, one of the few pastors that I respect, Dan Gaiman. I definitely had a sign from the Lord that he was real when I uh, researched him in 1990. So, verse 12. Six days thou shalt do work, thy work, and on the seventh day thou shalt rest that thine ox and thine ass may rest, and the son of thy handmaid and the stranger may be refreshed. And in all things that I have said unto you, be circumspect, and make no mention of the name of other gods, lest neither let it be heard out of thy mouth. Three times thou shalt keep a feast unto me in the year. Thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread. Um, that is occurs when Passover happens. Thou shalt eat unleavened bread seven days, as I commanded thee, in the time appointed for the, of the month they bib. For in it thou camest out of, the, out of from Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty. Now the, um, the whole purpose of the Feast of Unleavened Bread was you were supposed to go through the house and get rid of all the leaven all the yeast out of the house. And I cannot find one instance in the Bible where leaven was called a good thing. Matter of fact, Christ told his disciples to beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which were the you-know-whos. Well, one sect or branch of the you-know-whos. And they said, oh, pfft, Man, we forgot to bring bread. And Jesus, you know, chided them. He got on them. And he says, you know, not beware the leaven of bread. Beware the doctrines, the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. And I'm paraphrasing, but... All right, you can read about uh, this in... Matthew chapter 16, and then specifically in verse 12, he said, Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. So, and if you want to read, you know, Matthew 16, verses 1 through 11, you can at your own leisure. I've covered this a number of times, so... All right, uh, let's see. Verse 16. And the feast of harvest, harvest, the first fruits of thy labors, which thou hast sown in, in the field, and the feast of ingathering, which is in the end of the year, when thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field. Three times in the year all thy males shall appear before the Lord God. Um. I believe one of these is called tabernacles. I am somewhat familiar in with the the uh, the feast days. I'm definitely not an expert in them, but uh, there we will keep at least the feast of tabernacles in the kingdom. Want proof? Let's do it. All right, let's take a look in Leviticus twenty three thirty four. Now. 
this Leviticus is the book for the Levites, who were the priests, who were the basically the the the, the spokesmen for the Lord. And it says in uh, Leviticus twenty three thirty four, speak unto the children of Israel, saying, the fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the feast of tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. Deuteronomy 16, 13. Thou shalt observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days. After that, thou shalt gather in thy corn and thy wine. And we're going to take a look at that also. Uh, let's see. Now, Passover, uh, the, the Lord's calendar year was basically an agricultural type calendar the first month of the year which was passover uh, was roughly somewhere around mid to late march or early to mid april somewhere in that range so the seventh month would have been october i'm just going april may june july august september october seventh uh, month would have been october approximately um you know, end of October, generally the growing season for summer crops is over. And that's when you would do the harvest. So, let's take a look at something here. Now, the feast day, uh, feast, feasts of the Lord, or the holy days, you could actually see the plan of salvation in there and i believe tabernacles is the um, the gathering of the harvest of the crops you know so you can probably contrast this with uh, god's gathering his people the harvest I believe I'm right about this. I, I'm just kind of throwing that out there. I haven't made a big study about this. so, But you, you can see the plan of God's plan of salvation in the, the uh, holy days, the feast days. All right, in Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 16, we read this about tabernacles. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. In that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord, and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar." Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. And all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and seethe therein. And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Well, this is future people. This is in the kingdom. This is obviously not now. I have a feeling the you-know-whos are going to try to trick us into thinking that this is come to pass but no i don't think so until christ appears in the sky and we're caught up in the air to be with him anything uh that that if that doesn't happen well it's the wrong messiah so all right so all right, Exodus 23, 17. Three times in the year all thy males shall appear before the Lord God. Thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread. 
uh, 11 is considered sin. I mean, that's just the way it is. So, it's symbolic of sin, you know. Neither shall the fat of my sacrifice remain until the morning. The first of the first fruits of thy land shalt uh, thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not seethe a kid in his mother's milk. That must have been some kind of Canaanite practice. Can you imagine taking a uh, a, a baby goat and boiling it in its own mother's milk? Verse 20. Here we go. Behold, I send an angel before thee. Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions. For my name is in him. But if, now here's the if, but if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies and an adversary unto thine adversaries. For mine angel shall go before thee and bring thee in unto the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will cut and I will cut them off. But God loves everybody. Uh, I don't think so. And I will cut them off. Thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do after their works, but thou shalt utterly overthrow them and quite break down their images. If only the church people would have a revival and do that today. Verse 25. And ye shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water. And I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. And I will take the coronavirus away from thee. Oh, I'm, well, or maybe 5G, I don't know. And I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. There shall nothing cast their young, nor be barren. Casting their young, um, that's like a miscarriage. Nor barren in thy land, the number of thy days I will fulfill. I will send my fear before thee, and will destroy, destroy, destroy all the people to whom thou shalt come. And I will make all thine enemies turn their backs unto thee. And I will send hornets before thee, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before thee. Do you know that there's a thing called Asian hornets? Um, very, they have them in Japan. These things are like, I've, I've heard they're like two and three inches long. I've heard that if you get stung by a couple of them, that their venom is so bad that people die. These things are nasty. And I'm not talking about being allergic to them. Everybody is allergic to these things. These things are killers. I mean, research it. Japanese hornets, they're nasty. Matter of fact, when they, uh, when they find a nest of these things, they, they go into overdrive to get rid of them. They are nasty. Uh, they can wipe out a bee's nest in no time at all. These things are bad news bears. I don't know if these are the same hornets, but... Uh, and I will send hornets before thee, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before thee. I will not drive them out from before thee in one year, 
lest the land become desolate, and the beast of the field multiply against thee. Now, um, some people wonder about the best beast of the field. They wonder if it's two-legged beasts or four-legged beasts. Take your pick. You know, the thing was, is the Lord would drive them out bit by bit when Israel increased in size and they could take care of the land. Now, you got to realize something. Israel was going into a place where the crops had already been planted, the trees had already been planted, they're bearing fruit, houses were already built. Because Satan's children here, the Canaanites, went to the promised land to oppose God's people. And God's like, okay, I'm going to cast these people out. You get rid of them, and all the work of their hands is yours. So, but the thing was, they would take over an area, increase in size, take over an area, increase in size, and fill up the land so that the uh, beast of the field doesn't multiply against them. Because uh, the Spanish conquistadors released pigs into the United States, and they root up and destroy everything. Just totally will destroy croplands. I mean, they have to really work at getting rid of these blasted things, so... All right, so, verse 30. By little and little I will drive them out from before thee until thou be increased and inherit the land. And I will set thy bounds from the Red Sea even unto the Sea of the Philistines and from the desert unto the river. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand and thou shalt drive them out before thee. Thou shalt make no covenant with them nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in thy land, lest they make thee sin against me. For if thou serve their gods, it shall surely be a snare, a trap. It, shall, it will surely be a snare unto thee. All right, let's go to Exodus 33. Verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart, and go up hence, thou and the people, which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed will I give it, and I, and I will send an angel before thee. There's that angel again. And I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. Now, in Exodus 32, I just re did this in a recent study, I don't remember where, but it was recent. Um, that's where Moses came down from the mountain and they had uh, gave Aaron all the gold, and they made a golden calf, and they're worshiping the golden calf. Behold thy gods that brought thee out of the land of Egypt, O Israel. Lord wasn't too happy about that. So, you want to worship a golden calf? Go to Wall Street. All right, verse 4. And when the people heard these evil things, they mourned, and no man did put on him his ornaments. I guess that's their uh, their rings and their necklaces and their earrings, or I don't know. That's kind of what I, not my take. For the Lord had said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, Ye are a stiff-necked people. I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore now put off thy ornaments from thee, that I may know what to do unto thee. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Horeb. And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it, with, uh, pitched it without the camp, 
afar off from the camp and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation which was without the camp. And it came to pass when Moses went out unto the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. Now remember, this is the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day that led them out of Egypt. And uh, I covered this in a Bible pl uh, study playlist uh, called Clouds, if anybody's interested. All right, so, and the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Now remember, Joshua... Um, you know, honestly, I think this is how the Hebrew roots sacred name people should be pronouncing that name, not Yeshua. I think it's Joshua. I have caught them mispronouncing names on purpose, just so that you think that they know what they're actually talking about. I think, you know, Joshua means actually means salvation. And you know, when Moses died, who led the who led the Israel? Joshua. Joshua is the sixth book in the King James Bible. It's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. I think it's Joshua, not Yeshua. So Joshua's inside the tabernacle with Moses. And the Lord is talking to Moses face to face. I don't know what Joshua's doing, but I'm her here. I'm sure he's getting an earful. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore, I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, If thy present presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. I've heard so many people say that there was no grace in the Old Testament. But here it says, For thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before me, before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. The Lord is so holy that us in the flesh, we can't see him face to face. We would die. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, when my glory passeth by, that I will put thee 
in a cleft of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts. But my face shall not be seen. Boy, that's something. The Lord is, uh, Moses saw the Lord, the back of the Lord. <laughs> Isn't that something? All righty. Let's see what, uh, all right, 30 minutes has gone by. I'm not sure if I'm going to do another chapter or not. All right, let's do one more chapter here. We're going to do Numbers chapter 20, verse 1. Uh, I'm going to, God willing, I'm going to do commentary on every place in the Bible where the an angel is mentioned. So, let's take a look at Numbers 20. Verse 1, Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin. Z-I-N. I think that's the desert of Sin. In the first month, and the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Now, Miriam was the sister of Moses and Aaron. And there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. You know, when they chode, uh, means they're fighting against him. Verse 4, And why have ye brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness, that we and our cattle should die there? Oh boy, God just loves complainers. I'm being sarcastic. And therefore have ye made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us in unto this evil place. It is no place of seed or of figs or of vines or of pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the, con uh, of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak, speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. And it shall give forth his water. And thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. Now, is this the same rock that Jacob used for his Jacob's pillar for his uh, pillow in an earlier study we did on this? I think it was in study number one or study number two on angels. I'm not sure, but it was one of the early ones. Is this the same rock? It could be, but I'm, I'm not totally sure. But I'm of the opinion it probably is. All right, here we go. So the Lord told Moses to uh, take the rod, gather the people together, and speak to the rock. Okay, and uh, and then water would come out of the rock. Now, verse 9. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him, and Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And what's... What's this we stuff? Do you, do, you, do you have a mouse in your pocket, Moses? What's this we stuff? No, you're not doing, no, you're not bringing the water out of the rock. The Lord is. Verse 11, And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rod, he smote, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, 
because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the congregation of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. So the Lord was not pleased that Moses struck the rock twice. And he was that, uh, you know, we are going to bring you this water stuff. No. You know, he should have said, well, the Lord commanded me to do this. But it's the Lord, you know, bringing forth the water. So, verse 13. This is the water of Mirabah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord, and he was sanctified in them. And Moses sent messengers from Kadesh unto the king of Edom, Thus saith thy brother Israel, Thou knowest all the travail that hath befallen us, how our fathers went down into Egypt, and we have dwelt in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians vexed us and our fathers. Now, you got to realize something. Edom probably heard the story of, you know, the drowning of Pharaoh's army. I'm sure I'm sure that story went far and wide. You would think so. You know, maybe they don't know. I don't know. Um how our fathers went down into Egypt and we have dwelt in Egypt a long time and the Egyptians vexed us and our fathers. Verse 16. And when we cried unto the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel. Ah, he sent an angel. And hath brought us forth out of Egypt. And behold, we are in Kadesh, a city in the uttermost of thy border. Let us pass, I pray thee, through thy country. We will not pass through the fields or through the vineyards. Neither will we drink of the water of the wells. We will go by the king's highway. We will not turn unto the, to the right hand nor to the left until we have passed thy borders. And Edom said unto him, Thou shalt not pass by me, lest I come out against thee with the sword. And the children of Israel said unto him, We will go by the highway, and if I and my cattle drink of thy water, then I will pay for it. And I will only, without doing anything else, go through on my feet. And he said, Thou shalt not go through. And Edom came out against him with much people and with a strong hand. Now, take a look at Malachi chapter 1, where the Lord says he hated Esau. And, uh, and Esau is Edom. And I'll tell you what, God is not going to dwell uh, deal nicely with Edom. Matter of fact, take a look into the uh, you know who ish encyclopedia in the in the Esau Edom part. It'll even say that Esau Edom is in modern you know who today. Of course, the uh, the online versions are starting, encyclopedias are starting to censor that information. Because, you know, anytime something becomes popular, it vanishes. For example, um, there was a lady named Gail Ripplinger, who I have a lot of respect for. She did a phenomenal coursework on the King James Bible and the changes between it and the modern Bibles. And the changes in the words and the, the things that are missing gives you a very good indication of the direction that the devil and his children are going to herd us into. For example, the modern Bibles do away with the word virgin in Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah 7, 14, and they just say, you know, eh, young woman. And they want you to think, well, you know, Mary really wasn't a virgin. She was just a young woman. Well, uh, there was a girl down in South America that was, I think she was five or six when she got pregnant and had a baby. 
Was it a was it a uh, miracle? I don't think so. I think it was an uncle. You know, not the Lord. But uh, you know that that's you could take a look at and see all the changes that they've made. Well, there's a guy. I call him a goat. His name is Dr. James White. I only have a master's degree. He went to college, Bible college two years longer than me, so that makes him a doctor of the law. And uh, he does all kinds of things, telling people how the King James is just so full of errors. But he's so smart that he knows how to correct them. And what's really funny is that uh, the Muslims will say, well, yeah, the, the Bible's in error. And, of course, Dr. James White will debate with them. And to the Christians, he makes them think that he's actually trying to prove the Muslims wrong, that the Bible's not in error, but when you get down and listen to him carefully, he's actually agreeing with the Muslims that, yeah, the Bible has errors in it. But we know where they are, so we can correct them. Well, I found out that he was on the New American Standard Bible, the NASB uh, Bible, which was put out by the Lockman Foundation. Dewey Lockman, on his website, he's dead now, but on the Lockman Foundation website, it was, it was, uh, they said that Dewey Lockman was a member of the Masonic Lodge. He was a Mason. And then it said that um, James White was on the committee for the NASB. You know, he was a paid consultant. And that's why he was always pushing the NASB as being the most accurate. Well, it's conflict of interest, don't you think? So I did a, a website on this, uh, well, not a, just a website, but I mean, a, I did a YouTube page, and I had the links proving all this stuff, and sure enough, um, James White's name disappeared from the uh, paid consultants list not long afterwards. So, you know, they watch this stuff, and then people will come back and say, Bob, you're a liar. I went to that web page and James White's name's not on there. Well, it used to be. And I wish to God I would have made copies of, you know, the page, but I didn't do it. But, you know, Jesus said, by their fruits, ye shall know them. What can I tell you? So, verse 20. And he said, Thou shalt not go through. And Edom came out against him, Israel, with much people and with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his border. Wherefore Israel turned away from him. And the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, journeyed from Kadesh and came unto Mount Hor. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in Mount Hor by the coast of the land of Edom, Edom saying, Now, this is... This is it, people, for Aaron. Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, for he shall not enter into the land which I have given unto the children of Israel, because ye rebelled against my word at the water of Meribah. Take Aaron and Eliezer his son, and bring them up unto Mount Hor, and strip Aaron of his garments, and put them upon Eliezer his son. And Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, and shall die there. And Moses did as the Lord commanded, and they went up into Mount Hor in the sight of all the congregation. And Moses stripped Aaron of his garments and put them upon Eliezer his son. And Aaron died there in the top of the mount. And Moses and Eliezer came down from the mount. And when all the congregation saw that Aaron was dead, they mourned for Aaron thirty days, even all the house of Israel." So there you have it, people. You might be friends with the Lord, but when you disobey Him, um, there's judgment, there's punishment. I'm an expert 
on getting spanked. Trust me. I have failed the Lord so many times. Um, yeah. Now, remember in, what was it, verse 20? Uh, let's see. No, 6. Hold on a second here. Okay. And Moses lifted up his hand, verse 11. And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice, and water came out abundantly. And the congregation drank, and their beasts also. Now, is there a companion verse to this? Yes, there is. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, the Red Sea. Now, now think about this. Paul's writing to the Corinthians, a city in Corinth, a Greek church, a Greek-speaking church of Greeks in a Greek city named Corinth. They were Corinthians. And he says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers, all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, the Red Sea, right? And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Paul's telling them, you guys were with Moses when Israel crossed the Red Sea, and we're not talking spiritually. Read Jeremiah 3.8, where God divorced Israel. Read Jeremiah 31.31, where God says that he would make a new covenant with the house of Judah and with the house of Israel. These people were Israelites. Otherwise, he wouldn't be saying this. And we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat? What meat? Manna. Verse 4. And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Remember when Moses struck the rock twice? That rock was Christ. It was symbolic of Christ providing the water of life, physical life, and remember the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman? Christ told her about living waters. Read about that in Revelation. I think it's, it's, I think it's Revelation 22. Let's take a look. Well, you can read about it in John chapter 7 and verse 38. Jesus said, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. John 4, 14. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. There you go. Uh, let's see. How about Revelation 7, 17? For the Lamb which is in the midst of, th of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them into living fountains of water. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Now remember, um, you know... I, People try to convince you that Revelation's in chronological order. It's not. It's not. I mean, Revelation 7, 17 is not even close to the end of the Revelation. There's 22 chapters. So, uh, let's take a look. Revelation 21, 6. And he saith, and he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Revelation 21, 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. 
Revelation 22 and verse 17. And we're going to close this out. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. All right, people, That's I think that's going to be it. Um, 50 minutes, that's long enough for a Bible study. Um, I don't know how long I'm going to be on the tube. We'll see. You know, as long as the Lord wills, I will be on here. But uh, when they boot me off, eventually I'll be on BitChute for as long as they're around. Um, honestly, I don't know how long they're going to be around either. I've heard there have been uh, kicking people off too. I don't know why, but you know. So all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen.